If you've ever taken a physics class or studied physics, you may have been told that electric and magnetic fields aren't real. Well, that's a lie. We've actually known for at least 90 years that they might be real, and for 50 or more that, yeah, or 70 or more that they probably are. Because what is going on with the quantum field is it's filled with particle pair dipoles. And the typical, uh, prototypical particle pair dipole is electron positron pair, which has positive and negative charge. So that means that the medium of space, the quantum field, is polarizable. And you can go online and look up polarizable vacuum and virtual particles, and, and it'll explain all those types of things. This is very common physics. It's well-known quantum field theory. Yet for some reason, there are physicists still today that deny that the electric and magnetic fields are real. And American physicist Robert Dickey in the 50s was one of the first to actually publish that, that once you have a polarizable vacuum, a medium filled with dipoles, that the electric and magnetic fields become real and the electric and magnetic constants become a consequence of interactions within the field. Uh, I'll go into that more in, in other lectures on the constants. But anyway, one of the greatest examples demonstrating the particle pair model was the Casimir effect. With the Casimir effect, Casimir recognized that if you have two plates in space, that as they get closer, longer wavelength quantum fluctuations can't exist in that space. And that caused a reduction in forces called Van der Waals forces that I'll discuss in a moment. And then as the two plates get closer and closer together, eventually the forces pushing them together overcome the forces pushing them apart, which are now reduced, and the plates get pushed together. Now the effect occurs in a measurable way at about one micron and smaller distances. And it was originally proved in the late 1990s that, that this was indeed a true effect, although they initially used a sphere and a plate to, to demonstrate it. And then later they found out that there are geometries that can push uh, plates apart depending on the shape. So the Casimir effect works both ways. And the Casimir effect, the influence of retardation on London van der Waals forces, is specifically a London van der Waals force. And with Van der Waals forces, you have two particles interacting. And Van der Waals won the Nobel Prize for this. Van der Waals forces are a very well-known part of electrochemistry. But a lot of people don't think about Van der Waals forces with regard to what the quantum field is doing. And what happens with dipoles, if I have two dipoles, say my thumbs are positively charged and my fingers are negative, as the positive charges get together, they repel, which contracts dipoles slightly. And if I go the other way, they get attracted, which expands the dipoles. So that means space filled with dipoles is constantly jiggling a little bit um, as the dipoles interact with each other. And these cause van der Waals forces, which can push on bodies. And so there's a general van der Waals force that pushes the same in all directions when you have one object in space. But if you have two objects in space that interact with each other in some way, either by eliminating dipoles or in another fashion that I'll talk about in other videos, then you can have two plates pushed together, or any two objects pushed together. Or you can have them pushed apart, depending on geometry and, and other types of things that might increase the force between the objects. So the Casimir effect proves the existence of Van der Waals forces, which proves the existence of quantum electric charge dipoles which confirms the particle pair model, which has been around since the discovery of the positron in the early, in late 20s, early 30s. So once we have particles in space, dipoles in space, when we have an electron moving through space or any other charge, it will cause the dipoles to rotate. They'll polarize so that they orient themselves with respect to the charge. And then if the charge is moving, they'll rotate as the charge moves because they'll continue polarizing. And when they rotate, that produces a magnetic field. So in this case, um, you can use the right hand rule. The dipoles on the top 
have a north pole facing out and the black holes on the bottom have a north pole facing inward because the electron's moving this way. And then if we have uh, a positive and negative charge, say electron and proton, we get dipoles aligned forming an electric field that follows the familiar Faraday field lines. The Faraday field lines are real. They're physically real and they're made up of quantum dipoles of the quantum field. And once again, this is standard model field theory. It's something that should have been in every, every single textbook since the 1950s, if not earlier. And then with magnetic fields, as I said here, once you have a rotating dipole, a rotating dipole produces a magnet. If a dipole rotates this way, it produces a magnet with the north pole that way and the south pole the other way. So if you take a bar magnet and you move it, you get the same effect. You get these quantum magnets, these rotating dipoles, that orient with respect to a magnet. And then they can rotate as the magnet moves. So you have a, a magnet that, or a quantum dipole that's rotating in one direction to make it a magnet, and then it'll rotate in the orthogonal direction in response to the motion of another magnet. And so then we can have the field between two magnets with the north and south pole in an attractive configuration. And once again, we get these attractive type Faraday field lines between them, the general straight lines outside. And then because they're magnets, they have their own little internal field line loops of the magnetic field going from one end of the bar magnet to the other. So once again, we have real magnetic fields caused by real quantum dipoles in space. And then we can look at the repulsive configuration, this time between two electrons. And because as the way the dipoles line up, you end up with um, light charges opposite each other in the center, which causes them to repel. And when they repel, they deflect outward. And that creates this, this these curved field lines that are the typical Faraday field lines between electrostatic charges. Now with magnetic charges, if I had two bar magnets where I had light poles together, north to north or south to south, I get the same sort of, I get magnetic quantum dipoles, magnetized quantum dipoles that form these same types of lines, although they would still have these loops on the bar magnet from the north to south pole but you have a similar type of configuration with, with the quantum magnets, quantum, these quantum dipole magnets, forming a quantum magnetic field. So electric and magnetic fields are real. And so if you have a professor or a teacher that tells you electric magnetic fields are just a, a construction that we use to do the math, I tell them they're lying, tell them they're real, tell them about the quantum field, tell them the quantum field is polarizable. And even then, you, you can say, we can measure the electric and magnetic fields, and we can measure it with precision, and we can measure it over a tremendous amount of range of energies. Normally, when we can measure something extremely well, it's real. It's physically real. So I, I have no idea why physicists keep saying that they're not real. As I said, it should have been in textbooks that electric and magnetic fields are real since the 1970s. Anyway, if you like my video, please like, share, subscribe. And if you're interested in quantum field theory, look for more of my videos in the future, or you can buy one of my books. I, I'm putting links down below in the comments. And if you are interested in supporting my research as an independent researcher, I have a Patreon account, and so I appreciate your support. Thank you very much.